Yes. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Let me just read this scripture and then we'll be seated. This scripture is from Nehemiah chapter 6, verses 15 and 16. Check this out, church. Verse 15. So on October the 2nd, the wall was finished. Just 52 days after we had begun, when our enemies and the surrounding nations heard about it, they were frightened and humiliated. They realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. Turn to someone next to you and say, this work has been done with the help of our God. Give someone a high five, give someone a pound, a fist, let's do this. Thank you, worship team, you may be seated. Pastor Paul, our senior pastor, um, he's not here today. He is not just a local pastor, he's a regional pastor, and he's a man who has a, a wider role than that within our ministry, Victory Outreach. And so he's over there in the States right now at meetings, talking about things and discussing stuff. Can someone say amen? And so while he's taking care of business over there, we're here continuing to meet right here. But our pastor's wife, Sister Vicky, is here. How many want to put our hands together for our pastor's wife, Sister Vicky, if you love her? <laughs> we honor you, Sister Vicky. So I'm going to be speaking here today. Um, and I'm speaking from Nehemiah chapters 5 and 6. Believe it or not, Verse chapters 1 to 6 of this book is the whole completion of the wall. Today is a day that we think about and talk about the completion of the wall. Pastor Paul has been preaching over these past weeks, I think about five or, or six messages, I believe, of all the way through Nehemiah from chapter 1 to this point right here. So you can find them on our YouTube channel there. And by the way, welcome to everyone there on YouTube. It's really great to have you uh, with us today. But here we get to chapter 5 and chapter 6, where the wall is completed. And what a great story it's been. What a great story it's been as we move through it. We started there in chapter 1, where Nehemiah, who was a cupbearer to the king of Persia, he's there in a very high position with the king. And he, um, he's a Jew. He's not Persian. He's Jewish. And so many years before, um, the Jewish people had been exiled uh, from their land. Um, they'd been taken captive by the Babylonian Empire. The Lord had allowed this because they themselves, the people, had strayed from his ways. And because of their straying from his ways, he allowed the people to be exiled as captives from um, Babylon for about, so from, from their land by Babylon for about 70 years. Um, after those 70 years were completed, they began to move back. He kind of opened things up, and they were able to start moving back. And one of the first things they did as they moved back was they got to work rebuilding the temple. And I just love what that means in itself. The, what, one of the ways of getting back to where you need to be is to rebuild the temple. One of the ways, in fact, the way to get back to where you need to be in life is to rebuild the temple, is to start once again prioritizing the things of God in your life. It's about once again making God and the purposes of God the center of your life. I know that many of us know what it's like. I know what it's like when you drift away and you begin to put other things as number one in your life. After a while, you begin to realize, man, like, I, this isn't how it should be. Someone say, this isn't how it should be. This isn't how it should be. And so beginning to rebuild that spiritual center of our lives is the way to start getting back on track. So after those uh, 70 years, Zerubbabel and Ezra had gone back and had led the rebuilding of the temple right there in the city of Jerusalem. And so all these years later now, Nehemiah is there and, and some friends from the area come and they, they visit him there in Persia and he asks them, it says, he asked them, how is it going? How is it going with our people? 
How is it going with our people there in Jerusalem? I know the temple's being rebuilt, but how are things going since then? And in verse 3, this is what the, his friend Hananiah replied to him. They said to me, things are not going well. For those who return to the province of Judah, they are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down and the gates have been destroyed by fire. Isn't that interesting? It's interesting that even though they got started with the right thing, which is rebuilding the temple, the work had not been finished. The work had not been finished. You start to rebuild your prayer life. You start to rebuild your relationship with the word. That's where it starts, but you don't stop there. The walls around the city were still destroyed and were burnt with fire. And that's a big deal. The people were in disgrace. In verse 17, um, it says, you know very well what trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire. Let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and end this disgrace. Those who'd gone back to Jerusalem, even though they'd rebuilt the temple, they were still in disgrace because in those days in the ancient world, thick, high walls around the city, that's how cities were defended. Having the wall around the city was a sign that, number one, your city has a status, has something to protect that the people, of the, their lives and their livelihoods in that city are worth defending. That the, the, the city wasn't just a place that anyone could just come in and do whatever they like. Without city walls, enemies were easily able to enter into the city whenever they wanted. Even wild animals were able just to come in whenever they wanted because there were no walls around the city defending that city. I mean, can you imagine in our day and age, maybe living in a house that had no locks? No locked front door, no locked back door, no locked windows. Can you imagine living in a house where there was absolutely no security, no alarms, no neighborhood watch? Can you imagine one day walking into your house and finding just anybody sitting in there because they just felt like it? Can you imagine that? Walking into your kitchen and there's some stranger just chowing down on the pasta bake you just made. Like, hey, how you doing? You want some? Like, what? what? That's a disgrace. Wild animals were able to enter the city and just walk around at will. I mean, it's, it's, it's scary enough sometimes um, walking out late at night and anyone can be out there, much less some crazy wolf or some crazy beast just walking in around the streets of your city. That's a scary thing. It's a disgrace. And it kind of cut Nehemiah. It cut Nehemiah. You see, city walls were not just about security, but city walls were about dignity. Dignity. If anyone could just do whatever they want with you at any time, there's no dignity in that. And with the city walls, when the city walls are built, there's a dignity in that. That this is a city full of something that is worth something and, and is worth defending. See, dignity in my mind is like a combination of identity and purpose. See, when you deeply know your identity and when you know that there is a purpose for being who you are, there's a sense of dignity you have with that. When you know deeply who you are, when you don't know who you are, when you don't know where you come from, when you don't know what you're about, and when you don't know what your purpose is, you find yourself wandering and you're easily able to be swayed in one direction or swayed in another direction. Anyone's able to come and tell you anything and you're open to it because you don't know who you are and you don't know what your purpose is. But when you know who you are, when you know Know that you have a purpose. Someone can come to you and start treating you in any kind of way. It's like, no, I'm sorry. Do you know who I am? 
someone wants to come to you and wants to talk to you in a certain way. It's like, wait a minute, do you know who I am? Because I know who I am. And I'm not just here just taking up air. I'm not just here wasting O2. I'm not just here just like, I have a purpose in my life. I have a purpose. God breathed life into me. And God gave me a number of days to live on this earth for him. And there is a reason. There is a people that he's called me to reach. There is a work he's called me to build. You can't just treat me any old way because I know who I am in Christ. Do you know that in Christ I am a new creation? The old is gone and the new has come. You might have known me out in the streets. You might have known my own street name, but that's not my name anymore because if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. So don't look at me and talk to me like the way I was 10 or 20 or 30 years ago. I'm a new man today. I have a fresh sense of my identity and I have a purpose. I'm not just sitting here hanging around. I'm going somewhere in my life because God has placed a call on my life. See, when this is something that is deep down inside you, what comes from that is a sense of dignity. A sense of dignity. You walk differently. You, you, you talk differently. You plan differently. You pray differently. And when Nehemiah heard that the walls of the city were still in ruins, see, this wasn't just like a day after the temple was built, how are you doing? We, they didn't have like email back in them days or just a quick text on WhatsApp. Hey, how's it going, fellas? This wasn't just straight after the temple was rebuilt. In fact, this wasn't even a year after the temple had been rebuilt. In fact, this wasn't even five years after the temple had been rebuilt. In fact, this was more than 50 years. The temple had been rebuilt, but the walls still lay in ruins. Yeah? You see, you can, you can get back into the place of prayer. Amen, that's how you start. You can get back into your word. Amen, that's how you start. You can get back to church. Amen. That's how you start. You're rebuilding the temple. You're getting things in place. But listen, that's not it. Because we're not just called to be religious churchgoers. That's not it. There's more than that. There's more than that. Praise God if you've made the first step. Praise God if you've decided it's time to start prioritizing the, your spiritual life again. Praise God for that, man, because that's how you start. But that's just how you start. I want to let you know that there is more for you than just turning up. Just turning up is how you start, but there's more for you than that. God wants you to know who you are in him. God wants you to know that you were bought with a price. God wants you to know that he claims you as his own. God wants you to know that whatever you may think of yourself or whatever anyone else may say about you, he wants you to know what he thinks of you, that you are his son or that you are his daughter. Can someone say amen? And God wants you to know even more than that, that there is a purpose for your life. God doesn't want depression coming in like a wild beast stalking the streets of your heart. God doesn't want anxiety coming in like some predator eating away at your mind. God wants you to know that you have a purpose, that he has a destiny for you, that there is a call upon your life. And no matter where you are today, the best is yet to come for you in Christ because you have a call on your life. And that is something to defend. That is something to defend. That is something to protect. That is something to guard. That's why the Bible says, guard your heart. Because that is something to guard. There are plenty of wild beasts out there in the world today. But we are a people that need to know who we are and to guard our hearts. Nehemiah was cut to the heart when he heard that 50 years later, after the temple had been rebuilt, the people were still living in disgrace. The people were still not representing as the covenant people of God because the walls were still torn down. So he rose up. 
He said, listen, we can't let things remain like this. And remember, this wasn't just for him. He was doing okay. He was a cupbearer in the, in, in the king's presence. He was serving the king of Persia. He was a high-ranking official. This wasn't just about him. This was about his people. He said, my, this, the, my people, we're the people of God. And I can't stand by and watch my people living in disgrace. We need to rebuild those walls. See, that's how I came up in this ministry. There was a cry for our generation. There was a cry for our people. There was a cry for those who were still hurting. We'd been redeemed. We'd been saved. We'd been changed. And we were okay now. But there were still so many others who were still lost and who were still bound, who were still broken. And there was a cry in the generation. We can't leave it like this. We've got to do something. Can someone say amen? amen. So Nehemiah went back to Jerusalem with the king's approval and with the king's blessing. And somehow he managed, Nehemiah managed to get the people on board. He got individuals on board with the plan of rebuilding the wall. He got families on board with the plan to rebuild the wall. He got religious leaders on board with the plan to rebuild the wall. He got politicians on board with the plan to rebuild Build the wall. He got professionals on board with the plan to rebuild the wall. He got businessmen and businesswomen on board with the plan to rebuild the wall. Ain't that amazing? I mean, if anyone, we were talking about leadership training, the book of Nehemiah, Pastor Paul is going through this book for a reason. It is a master class in leadership. And Nehemiah somehow was able to go back to the city and got all these kinds of people involved in rebuilding the wall. That means if you're an individual here today, he got you on board. That means if you're a family here today, if you're here with your family, whether your husband or your wife, your kids or whatever, Nehemiah got you on board with building the wall. If you're a leader here today, a religious leader, maybe you lead a department, maybe you lead a team, or, or maybe you're a minister or whatever, he got you on board with rebuilding the wall. If you're here and you serve in politics in the political realm, maybe you serve in the council or maybe you serve um, in government, Nehemiah got you on board with rebuilding the wall. If you're a doctor here today, if you're a nurse here today, if you're an architect or if you're an accountant or if you're doing any of these things, Nehemiah got you on board with rebuilding the wall. If you're a business owner here today, if you have a small business, if you have some staff, five staff, 10 staff, 20 staff, 50 staff under you, Nehemiah got you on board. Nehemiah said, listen, this is not about more than just you as an individual. It's about more than just you as a family. Family. It's about more than just your business. It's about more than just your politics. It's about more than that. Our people need this wall rebuilt. And he got them on board. He gave them a vision of how Jerusalem was meant to be. He's like, wait a minute, in this region, this city of Jerusalem, this city that God gave to our people, this city that became the city of David, this city in which God established his temple, this city in which God called, uh, uh, separated and set aside to be a place for his people, this city lies in ruins. We need to do something about it. Jerusalem, he said, was meant to be a place that everyone around could see what it looks like to be the people of God. He was like, Jerusalem needs to be a place where everyone around can look and can see what it's like to have the blessing of God on you. What the favor of God is like. What it's like to be living in covenant relationship with God. He gave them a vision of how Jerusalem was meant to be like. If only we could catch a fresh vision of what the church is meant to be like. 
If only we could catch a fresh vision of what the church is meant to be like. Oh, I know many people may have had this experience or that experience or went through this or went through that. But if only every one of us could get a fresh vision of what the church is meant to be like. Because what the church is meant to be, the church is meant to be a place where people around can see what it's like to live under the blessing of God. The church is meant to be a place where people around can see what it's like to be living under the favor of God. The church is meant to be a place where people can come and discover what it means to experience the love of God, the healing of God, the peace of God, the joy of God. The church is meant to be a powerful place in the community. The word church comes from the word ecclesia, which means a called out assembly of people. A people who are not just blending in with everyone else, but a people who've been called out from among them to be a light to the world. Back in the ancient day, the word ecclesia was a word um, from in, in ancient Greek cities. It was a word which meant an assembly of citizens who gather to make decisions about the affairs of the city. Ecclesia meant an assembly of citizens who gather to make decisions about the affairs of the city. That word ecclesia carried some weight. That word ecclesia carried some importance. That word ecclesia carried some governmental authority. The church is not just some club where you come to feel good. But the church, God's church, the church that Jesus Christ is building is a place that is meant to have a governmental authority in the spiritual realm. That we are meant to affect territories around us. That situations change around us because of what God is doing inside us. That's what the church is meant to be, that when we start praying for our areas, when we start praying for the communities around us, when we start to pray for Salford, and when we start to pray for Trafford, and when we start to pray for Wigan, and when we start to pray for Bury, and when we start to pray for Rochdale, and when we start to pray for Stockport, and when we start to pray for Bolton, that things begin to change in the city around us, because the church is in place doing what the church is called to do and being what the church is called to be. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 that we are salt in the earth. And so Nehemiah gave the people of Jerusalem a fresh vision. Listen, get some dignity about you people. Understand who you are and understand that we have a job to do in this world. If you, want to, if you thank the Lord for who you are in Christ, put your hands together and give him some praise and say, thank you, God, for my identity. Thank you, God, for who I am. If God has healed you in your mind, begin to thank God. Thank you for healing my mind. Thank you for healing my heart. Thank you, O Lord God, for who I am in you. And of course, when they started to do this, the enemy didn't like it. The enemy don't like it when people find out who they are. The enemy don't like it when people begin to take their place in the kingdom. The enemy don't like it. He's not like, oh, shucks. Never mind then. No, 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 no. He hates it. No wonder sometimes you might feel like you're living under a blanket. No wonder sometimes you might feel like you're living under some, like, spiritual duvet. With spiritual la 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 Go to sleep, my baby. Don't rise up in who you are. Stay under the blanket. No one, the enemy hates it. He'd rather lull you to sleep play sweet, dulcet tones to you. 
Just rest and be calm. Don't get too passionate about this stuff. It's okay. Oh, it's okay to keep doing that thing. That's fine. Keep doing it. Oh, it's okay to keep going to that place. You keep going there. It's fine. Go to sleep, my baby. It's okay to watch that stuff. Oh, feel free. Go ahead. It's okay. Go to sleep, my baby. Because he knows that once the church rises up, he's going to lose territory. He's going to lose souls. <laughs> Sambalat and Tobiah and Geshem rise up absolutely furious. How dare you, Nehemiah, come back here rallying all these people to restore dignity to the city of Jerusalem. How dare you? We have things the way we want them. If the people are disgraced, that's how we like it. If the people are weak, we want them weak. If the people are poor, we want them poor. If the people are depressed, we want them depressed. They hated it, and they tried everything they do, could do to thwart the efforts of God's people. As they got to work on rebuilding the wall, they mocked them. As they got to work rebuilding the wall, they threatened them. As they got to work rebuilding the wall, and these were governors. Sambalat, Tobai, and Geshem were Persian governors. They were governors under the king. So they had some clout. They had some power, but they did not have the heart of God and they did not want to see the people of God succeed. So they did their best to ruin the work, to slow it down, to depress the people. The people had to find ways to pull together. To pull together. They started finding ways to defend one another. They got to work on the wall, but they had weapons on them at the same time, ready to fight in case the enemy came at any time to stop them from rebuilding. They were ready to fight. They had their spiritual lightsabers right there. Ready. And while they were building, their brothers, their sisters were, were, were patrolling and defending. And they would do it day and night from sunrise to sunset, from sunrise to sunset, building the wall ready to defend, building the wall ready to defend because they knew at any time the enemy was trying to come and to stop them from doing what it is that God had called them to do. This was an intense um, atmosphere. It was intense. We all want an easy life, right? But rebuilding the wall is not an easy life. Because once you start getting to work on your identity in Christ, once you start getting to work on your purpose in God, the whole atmosphere around you begins to change. Because the enemy hates it when a people find out who they are. Nevertheless, they kept building, defending one another, building, defending one another, building, defending one another, resisting all the external tests. But the external tests are one thing. The internal tests. Now that's another thing. That, that's a whole other thing. You know what I'm saying? I've seen brothers and sisters who, if anyone ever tries to come against them as a family, they pull together, stand there, don't you talk about him like that. And then when they get back in the house, they're not even talking to each other. Shut up, go away. <laughs> they pull together against the external threat, but in the internal, things are still not right. <laughs> There's still a way in for the enemy. Because even though it's good on the outside, there's still weakness on the inside. That's what we begin to see in chapter 5. We begin to see these disputes rise up. You see, this is what happened. A famine hit. A famine hit. Like of all things. 
number one, they were already living in poverty and they were already having to tolerate slavery in different ways in their community. And then number two, now they're trying to rebuild the walls of the city. And while they're trying to rebuild the walls of the city, no doubt there are still crazy wild beasts trying to like attack them while they're building. But while they're trying to rebuild the city, Sambalat, Tamir, and Geshem are doing their thing, trying to ruin them and tear them down. It's like when all of that is already happening, now something else comes. Famine. Famine. Man, like, really? One more thing? Have you ever had that experience? And you're like, really? One more thing? I'm trying my best. Have you ever just thought God just doesn't like you? Like, God just doesn't like me, man. Like, there's no way. Because I'm dealing with this, and I'm dealing with that, I'm dealing with this, and then that just comes through the post, like, really, God? Right? I'm already struggling with this thing. I'm already struggling with that thing. And now she calls me and starts saying all that, like, God? You know what I mean? You know, there are people that just don't think, they think God just doesn't like them. They're like, man, God, like God just doesn't like because all these things are happening to me. That, that He just doesn't like me. That's a lie, right? Ain't that a lie? Someone say, that's a lie. <laughs> what it is, it's a reality of what happens when you start getting to work on who you are and what you're called to do. Things start to happen around you to make it even harder. And so another layer came on top, famine. Now how are we going to do this? We're trying to rebuild the wall, trying to fight the enemy, and now we're trying to eat. Now, now we're trying to feed our children. They started doing things like mortgaging their fields mortgaging their vineyards and their homes in order to, to borrow money to be able to buy food. They started entering into this crazy economic distress. Who was lending them the money? The nobles of the city. The nobles of the city, I mean, I guess they probably had some kind of, you know, interest in the status quo. They themselves, the nobles, when you look at the people that helped Nehemiah rebuild, the scripture even says that some of the nobles were like, no, we don't want to help. Isn't that crazy? People that had means and had status that didn't want to help because they already had an invested interest in the status quo. And so the people, as the famine hits and they need to borrow now money in order to feed their families, they go to the nobles and the nobles start charging 12% interest on everything. It got to the point where they, um, they were actually having to sell their children into slavery. The people of God. The people of God. The covenant people of God. The ones that God brought out of slavery in Egypt are now selling their children into slavery to pay for food. Isn't that crazy? But you know what was really happening? They were beginning to feel the cost of what it of, of the cost of the decision to build. They were beginning to feel the cost of what it really takes when you decide to build. Because ministry costs. <laughs> Ministry costs, and I'm not just talking about money here. I'm not talking about money. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about it. It, it, it costs. There's there's a there's a price that is exacted from your life when you commit to building the work of the Lord. See, they they were building the wall, and then famine hits. The inclination at that point would be, you know what? Let's forget the war. Because I need to go and do something to feed the kids. That's the natural inclination. Let, let, let's forget the war. 
and let's go and do what we need to do to feed our kids. Now, that makes sense in the natural. That makes complete sense in the natural, really, doesn't it? I mean, some of you probably here are thinking, well, yeah, right? That's, that's what you do, right? Forget the wall. Just, like, forget it. It was a nice project. <laughs> it was a nice project. And it, and it was cool for a while. It was fun. <laughs> we were working together. We were pulling, you know, and then Deirdre was coming around making tea and serving the shortbread biscuits. Hi-ho, hi-ho, it's up to work we go. Like, wasn't it fun? But now this extra layer of difficulty has come. Do you know, let, let's leave this whole wall building thing for a bit. Right? It was, it, it, was, it was so interesting how when the pandemic hit, so many things changed. So many things changed when the pandemic hit. <laughs> right? Everyone starts reevaluating. well, how important is church anyway? Like, how, how important is church really? Like, really, really, really? Right? Like, we don't, we, we, we don't really need to build the church. I'm just trying to stay alive. You know what I'll do? I'll, 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 just, I'll just watch these ones. Oh, they're pretty good online. Oh, that's nice. They're good. Oh, that's a, let's, let's try these ones. Oh, they're good too. Oh, what do you think, Mabel? Should we do uh, this church today or that one online? Bring me slippers, will you, love? Right? And, and there, was no one, there was no one coming into your house with the offering basket. No, no one came in. Oh, here's the offering basket. All right, then. No one came in with the offering basket. So it's like, oh, you know, I, um, oh, look on Amazon. They got this happening. Yeah. Amazon Prime, one day delivery. People's priorities began to change. People's understanding of the rhythm of life began to change. Things start happening on the news and we're all watching it 24 seven because we have nothing else to do. And this riot and that riot and this issue and that issue. And like everything's like, oh, what are we even doing? Forget this wall. I'll build my own wall. I can build walls too, you know. What's so good about Nehemiah's wall? Wait till you check out my wall. I can build a wall, bro. And suddenly the whole idea of pulling together to rebuild the wall is like, no, we've we got other things that are more important now. But the truth is, there is a cost to building the work of the Lord. Now, I want to say categorically, I disagree with them selling their children into slavery. I completely disagree with that. I don't think that was the right decision. And Nehemiah, as the leader, he didn't even know it was happening at first. When he was made aware of the fact that things had got this bad and that the nobles were treating them this badly, the Bible says in chapter 5, he got angry. And he went and he pulled those nobles together and said, what on earth are you doing? And he sorted it out. He got on it immediately. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't that the leader didn't care or the leader couldn't hear. It wasn't that. He didn't even know. And as soon as he found out, he did what he could. Can someone say amen? But what was really happening, what was really, really happening was people were beginning to feel there's a real cost to building this wall. See, they went into this either or kind of mentality. Sort of like, well, either we're going to rebuild the wall or we're going to do this for our family. It's either this or it's this. And of course, if it's really an either or situation, what are you going to do? You're going to do this. If it's either or, of course you're going to do this. 
But is it either or? Is it either or? Man, I praise God that throughout the pandemic, we were able to still have church. I praise God that throughout the pandemic, because of Pastor Paul's leadership and Sister V's leadership, we were still able to make sure that services, quality services were online. We had food parcels going out to people who needed it. We were visiting people if we could within the restrictions of the time. We were doing whatever we could. We continued to do the work of building the church. We continued to give. We continued to to build. We continued to project. We didn't stop. We came in here, a small team of us, every single week. We did what we could. We upgraded what we could to make sure that we were still able to do the best we could online. And we were calling and we were texting and we were doing what we could to continue to build the work of the church. We had families too, but how many know God blessed our families? God blessed our families. God blessed our families as we worked. See, it's not either or, it's both. Think about it. Think about it. What was really at, what was really at stake if they had stopped building the wall? If they had stopped building the wall, the wild beasts would still have free reign. If they stopped building the wall, Enemies would still be able to come in and do whatever they want, whenever they want. If they stopped building the wall, they would still not have their sense of dignity because they still would not know who they are. They're taking care of this and they're taking care of that, but they're doing it laboring under this sense that I don't know who I am. I don't know what my purpose is. I'm just surviving. I'm just trying to make it through. And that's just for that generation. What would have happened for the next generation? What would happen for the next generation? And the sin and, and enemies around, the status quo staying in place while the people of God grow up from generation to generation still thinking that they're not worth anything, still thinking that they have no God-given purpose, still getting caught up in this and in that and the other because they don't know where they belong. If they stopped building the wall, nothing would change. And that was the plan. That was what was happening. It was an, a spiritual attempt to stop them from building the wall. But it's not either or. It's both. You do what you have to do for your family, and you do what you have to do for your people. It's both. You do what you have to do for your children, and you do what you have to do for the next generation. It's both. And when you sense that call on your life, man, I've had to come to terms with it. I've had to come to terms that there are some sacrifices I've had to make. I have people that, that are the same age as me that are doing things that I have not been able to do or have done things that I haven't been able to do because I have felt a call on my life to the ministry. And there are things I've had to say no to. And there are doors I've had to allow to close because I recognize there's a call on my life. I could pursue just getting more money. I could pursue just getting more status. I could pursue just getting to certain tables. But while I'm pursuing that, the wall's still broken down. So I've got to think about more than just myself. I've got a call on my life. And I've got to answer the call of my life. So come on, Mrs. Farrell. Come on, Dill. Karen, come on, wake up. Come on, Kai. Come on. We still got work to do. It's about more than just us. It's about our generation. How many hear what I'm saying? That's why I called this message. It's going to be worth it. It's going to be worth it. Because when you feel the cost being exacted from your life, it's only human to think, man, is this worth it? You don't think I've never thought that? You don't think I've ever sat there? You think I've just, what, you think I just float on clouds like this and just like, mm, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Holy, 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 holy. Ooh. Yes. 
having sweet cups of tea with Jesus. You don't think sometimes I sit there by myself in the room and I cross my legs like this and I hold my hands and I'm like, God, is this really worth it? <laughs> you don't think I ever get them moments? Do you know what I mean? Like, God, you know, Johnny's doing this and Bradley's doing that and Felix is doing this and, and Giuseppe's doing that. <laughs> is it really worth it, Lord? But I have a call on my life. I have an identity in Christ and a purpose. And I've got to trust. See, what happened? And this is where we start bringing it home. Fear came in. Fear came in. They were doing so well. They were doing so well. The war was more than half finished. They were doing so well. But when that famine came, fear, they got scared. What if we can't do this? Fear of losing control. Fear of being overtaken by stuff. The enemy started to lie. This is ridiculous. This is ridiculous. Put down those tools. Stop working on that wall. God can't provide for you while you build. God can't fulfill you while you build. Put down your calling. Put down your purpose. Fear gripped them. The fear of losing control. And they started to panic. Why did they sell their kids into slavery? Was that God's will? No. It was panic. They panicked. They started making decisions that were not based on faith. They started making decisions that were based on fear. That's why so many times in the Bible, Jesus tells us, fear not. And that's a tension that I believe people with that call on your life, you'll feel that tension. That tension of like, man, is this really worth it? And fear will try to grip you. You're wasting your time. There's other things you should be doing. Put down this crazy idea that God's going to use you. Put it down. There's other things you got to do. You can't really do this. Just like forget all that and start doing this other thing over here because urgency says you have to do it. But what's really happening in that moment is that you are just simply beginning to feel what it costs costs to build the wall. You're feeling the cost of the call. And I want to let you know today, if you commit and decide, I'm going to pay the price. I'm going to do what it is I'm called to do. I'm not going to down tools. I'm going to stay focused. I'm going to stay in position. I'm going to build the wall. I want to let you know that whatever it is you go through, whatever it is you sacrifice, whatever it is that you experience, whatever things that God allows to come into your life, wherever wind begins to blow, wherever famine starts to rise, wherever things starts taking place in the, th in the heavenlies above your head, I want to let you know that if you stay focused, if you keep building, it will be worth it. It will be worth it. The wild beast will be held back. The enemy will be held back. The status quo will be broken. The enemy will no longer have reign in your life. And generations after you will live with a fresh sense of who they are in Christ. Your children will grow knowing who they are in Christ. Their children will grow knowing who they are in Christ. I don't still have everything that I would like to have in life, but I also know that there is a, pro a, a process that God is working in me and God is working in my family. But I know, you know what I do? Rather than looking at all the sob stories, I look at the ones who have already gone further than me. I look at Pastor Paul. I look at Sister Vicky. They gave up everything to come here to Manchester with their children and to build the wall and 
all these years later, after all they sacrificed and after all they went through, you look at them today. You talk to them today. They are blessed. They are strong. Sickness tried to get them, but God gave them victory over sickness. Their children are beautiful, rising strong in the house of the Lord. I'm telling you, if you look for those that you can see, that's what God is able to do. And say, if you could do it for him, if you can do it for her, you can do it for me. I will not give up on the wall. I will not give up on the church. I will not give up on what God has called me to do. Because if he can bless my pastor, and if he can bless his wife, he can bless me too. It's going to be worth it. I said it's going to be worth it. I said you might feel pain, but it's going to be worth it. You might feel the warfare, but it's going to be worth it. People may try to distract you and discourage you, but stay focused, my brother. It's going to be worth it. I love this thing that Nehemiah prayed. In Nehemiah chapter 5, verse 19. See, Nehemiah made sacrifices too. You can read them in verses 16 to 18. Nehemiah had to make sacrifices. But in verse 19, Nehemiah prayed this. Remember, oh my God, all that I have done for these people and bless me for it. Remember all that I have done for these people and bless me for it. That's actually a really beautiful prayer. That's actually a really beautiful prayer because what that means is this. As Nehemiah made his sacrifices, as Nehemiah went through what Nehemiah had to go through in order to do what God had called him to do, he wasn't looking to the nobles. He wasn't looking to the people. He was looking to God. He said, God... While this price is being exacted from my life, God, remember me. Remember me. I've made my decision, God. I've made my choice. I'm going to build what you called me to build. And I'm not doing it for me. I'm doing it for the people. I'm doing it for my generation. I'm doing it for my city, my community. I'm doing it, Lord God, for them. So God, despite all that I'm having to experience and all that I've had to let go of and all I've had to say no to, Lord God, remember me and bless me. Nehemiah's eyes were on God. He said, God, I know you will take care of me. I know you'll let me feel some stuff. You'll let me go through some stuff. But God, you're still in control. And you will bless me. It will be worth it. This just comes to the keyboard. Read. Chapter 6, verse 16, one more time. We read it at the beginning of this message. But read it one more time. In fact, read it on verses 15 and 16. So on October the 2nd, the wall was finished. Just 52 days. We're not talking about like a, like a wall. <laughs> it wasn't a fence, you know what I mean? <laughs> little gate. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You know, around the ginnel. <laughs> this was a wall around the city. And just regular people like you and me, in 52 days, they built it. Don't underestimate the power of God to accelerate. Accelerate. As a church, we have momentum right now. We have momentum. 
And I believe that God wants to accelerate us as we move forward into what it is, as we move forward into his call upon us as a church. 52 days they had finished the war, verse 16. When our enemies and the surrounding nations heard about it, they were, what? When, the en when our enemies and the surrounding nations heard about it, they were what? <laughs> they were the ones who were having fear all along. They attacked you with fear because they were afraid. The enemy is afraid of what you are going to be when you take your place in the call of God. The enemy is afraid of what God, by his grace, will work through your life when you take your place in the call of God. And because he's afraid, he wants to make you afraid so that you don't do it. But when the wall was built, play them keys, bro. <laughs> Play them, bro. Let me feel it. Let me feel it. Oh. You feel that? How many love Josh, man? He's a man of God, people. When they finished building that wall, the enemy was like, oh, no. Oh, man, we tried our best. We threw everything we had at these people. We threw scandal. We threw rumor. We threw mocking. We threw insinuation. We threw famine. We threw everything we could possibly throw at these people. And they did not stop building. Now what are we going to do? All having their demonic huddles. They were the ones who were scared all along. So listen. Make the decision of faith today. No sugarcoating it. You will feel the warfare. You will feel it. You will feel discouragement trying to, you will feel depression trying to, you will feel attacks from the outside trying to, you will feel the tension on the in, you will feel it. You'll feel it. But be like Nehemiah who said, oh God, remember what I'm doing for these people and bless me. Bless me, God. There's... <laughs> You can't, the prayer for blessing, it's so different when you pray that prayer from a position of doing what God called you to do. When your conscience is clear and you know that you're doing what God called you to do, then you can lift up a holy, humble prayer to God. Say, God, I'm doing what you said. I'm doing it. Bless me, Lord. Bless me, God. And I believe that God is going to bless some people in this church like never before. I believe that there is another dimension of blessing that is there for us. As we take our place on the wall, let's stand. Worship team, come and take your places. It's going to be worth it, church. It's going to be worth it. Reactivate now, church. Reactivate. If you used to be on the wall building... And this, that, and the other happened and took you off the wall. Listen, God is a merciful and gracious God. Get back on the wall now, fam. Get back on the wall now. Find your place on the wall. Say, God, I'm not, I'm not downing tools 
anymore. I'm getting back up. I'm picking my tools up, Lord God, and I'm getting back to work. And Lord God, as I do it, as I commit to the war, bless me, God. Bless me, God, as I do what you've called me to do. Come on, lift your hands right now. We're going to speak to the Lord as the worship team begins to sing right now. Come on. <laughs> 